If you had to think of the three biggest questions in science today, what would they be? Maybe you're thinking, can we cure cancer? Can we solve the climate crisis? Or maybe even, can we make it to Mars? For Jack Shostak, the biggest questions are much more fundamental. Yeah, to me, they're the origin of the universe, uh, the origin of life, and the origin of the mind or consciousness. Shostak is a Nobel laureate and professor of genetics at Harvard. They're like the big questions I think, you know, everyone would like to have some understanding of. (laughs) The origins of the universe, life, and mind are, needless to say, all quite complicated. So Shostak decided to answer just one. The first and third just seem uh, too hard. The order of life is much easier. Shostak has dedicated the last two decades of his prolific career to figuring out how life on Earth began. We all want to know, one way or another, how we came to be here. And you know, if you just look around at life in the world, it's so amazing and varied and beautiful, and and is so different from everything that's inanimate. It just raises the question of, you know, how did, how did this difference arise and how did it lead to us? Shostak's career has positioned him to be uniquely prepared to find that out. He's been at Harvard for more than 40 years, won a Nobel Prize in Medicine for his work in telomeres or the structures at the end of chromosomes, and he holds a distinguished position at Mass General Hospital and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Recently, he gave a lecture as part of the University of Chicago's Origins of Life speaker series. I've always more or less worked on some aspect of nucleic acid chemistry. And and that's fundamental for the origin of life because what you need to have a living system is something that can carry information from generation to generation. From the University of Chicago, this is Big Brains, a podcast about the pioneering research and pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. This episode, How Life Began. I'm your host, Paul Rand. What does that actually mean in your mind when you talk about the origin of life? Yeah, so, you know, we can't go back to the early Earth. We don't have time machines. So what I'd like to have is a picture of sort of the whole process, you know, going all the way from planet formation and understanding early environments, understanding the chemistry that gave rise to the building blocks of life, and then how those molecules assembled together to make very simple cells that could start to evolve and and then through the process of evolution eventually lead to us. And, and so when we think about it early on, and at least historically with philosophers and theologians and others, this whole concept of of a creator or a life giver comes into this. And, and maybe get this out of the way right up at the start. How, how do you think about that? It, you know, the problem just seemed so hard, so incomprehensible that people had to come up with these kinds of supernatural explanations. That if you think of the origin of life or the nature of life as a scientific question, you know, then you can sort of break it down into simpler questions and, and try to understand how life actually did get started. And, and I think everything that we're learning says that you know, this is a natural process that you know, follows the laws of physics and chemistry, and there's nothing magical about it. Rather than despair in the idea that there's nothing magical about life, Shostak delights in it. It seems to free him to appreciate the world in all of its natural wonder. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Shostak started to fixate on the origins of life back in the 1990s. My lab was working on what we call directed evolution. Directed evolution means introducing mutations to molecules, looking for variants that could be useful, and then allowing those novel molecules to reproduce. Think of it like GMO'd foods, but for molecules, like RNA. So we were doing this molecular evolution in the lab, and it's very successful. It gives you lots of interesting uh, new kinds of molecules that you, you can evolve things to do what you want. But... It's one thing to do this in a lab, right, where you have all the resources of modern science at your disposal and you have all kinds of brilliant students uh, helping out and doing the experiments. And yet somehow evolution got started all by itself when the planet was young. And, And so I started to wonder more and more about how that could possibly have happened. Life has, of course, evolved over billions of years. But what did it evolve from? 
How did molecules first get together and start acting like a living system? Well, let's start with what we know. First, Earth formed a little over four and a half billion years ago. And after the moon forming impact, it was certainly a very violent, hot, unfriendly place to be. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it didn't take that long, considering the entire history of the planet, to cool down, maybe 100 million years or so. So you have liquid water on the surface, you have some areas of dry land, you know, and then you can start to have local environments where different kinds of chemistry can start to happen. But this is where things get fuzzy. About 4.3 billion years ago, Earth may have had a habitat suitable for life. But we don't have solid evidence for life until the earliest fossils dated to about 3.7 billion years ago. That's a big stretch of time, right? It is. Somewhere in that seven or 800 million years, life got started and it could have been early on. Life could have popped up and been wiped out by impacts and then started up again. So, uh, well, you know, what we're trying to figure out are, are what were the necessary environments and the right kinds of chemistry and roughly where in that timeline and, and under what environments could life have gotten started. To explore what those environments may have been like, Shostak actually looks to Earth as it is right now. He and his students have gone out in the field to explore extreme habitats. Places in Norway and in Iceland and most recently to Yellowstone. Huh. So they, they tend to be volcanically active regions and they're, they're in many ways closely related to impact environments. but. Does that mean meteorites when you say an impact environment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you have like a large meteorite or a comet strike the planet, one of the key things is that you have sort of fractured rock and it's hot and water circulates through it and it extracts compounds from, from the rocks and brings them up to the surface. So you can see that kind of thing happening in, for example, in, in, in Yellowstone. Shostak is focused on volcanic areas in part because those kinds of environments would have created the extreme temperature fluctuations that are useful for chemical reactions. Exactly, yes, yes. The, the whole point is to get evolution going out of a chemical system. Those chemicals might have collected in pools or ponds, and then you need energy. The best source of energy is the sun. The ultraviolet radiation on the early Earth was stronger than what we experience now. And so that's a great source of energy and it can drive chemical reactions in the atmosphere. This can bring down to the surface compounds like cyanide. That's one of our favorites for a really great starting material for, for making all the building blocks of biology. So it's kind of ironic. Something as deadly as cyanide is maybe the best starting material to, to make the molecules of life, but that's kind of how it looks. And then what you need is a surface environments where these chemical feedstocks can be concentrated. They can sort of come together and, and start to react with each other. And then there's a whole series of pathways where you build up gradually more complicated molecules. And there's been a huge amount of work from other labs of gradually unraveling how you actually can make not just a random collection of thousands or millions of different compounds, but just the subset that you want to build life. And to me, the most interesting questions are, once you've got those correct chemicals, in the right environment. How do they get together and, and what are the processes that give rise to the first cells? All right, so let's assume that we've got the environment, we've got the chemicals. And then we have to put it in a cellular context, right? It has to have, be in some kind of membrane vesicle that's something that looks like the compartment that, that you see in a, in a modern cell. And we know how to make those membrane vesicles. We know how to make them grow and divide. By combining fatty acids with water. But what about genetic material? So here's where the fundamental puzzle of the origin of life is. That in modern cells, you have this really complicated biochemistry where you start with information stored in DNA. Oh, <laughs> Mr. DNA, where did you come from? From your blood. Just one drop of your blood contains billions of strands of DNA the building blocks of life. Transfer it to RNA and then you translate it to proteins. And every part of that system depends on every other part. It was always a puzzle as to how such a self-referential system could get started. A DNA strand like me is a blueprint for building a living thing. But in the beginning, what you need is something simple. Just 
good enough to get by and something that you can get to from the chemistry. And the breakthrough came from the realization that RNA, this molecule in the middle between DNA and proteins, RNA can actually do what DNA does because it carries information in its sequence of letters. And the big surprise was that RNA can also act like an enzyme. So it can catalyze chemical reactions, hmm. you can build structures with it. So RNA is probably not as good at doing either job, but it can do them both. Okay. Help translate that and, and, and help me understand the meaning of what the RNA world hypothesis is. I mean, it's almost, in some sense, silly to call it a hypothesis. It's, it's pretty firmly established. established yeah. <laughs> it mean, gives it, it a, a bit of gravitas, though, by calling it that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, you know, it's very simple. It, it's just the idea that the most primitive cells, the primordial cells, were based on RNA, which played the role of the genetic material. And they used RNA to carry out biochemical functions to catalyze reactions. And the smoking gun is the cellular machine, the ribosome, right, which it turns out it's built partly out of RNA and partly out of proteins, but it's the RNA part that actually makes new proteins. Mm. So RNA makes all the proteins in our bodies in every cell, so it makes sense that RNA came first. All we have to do is figure out how something as complicated as RNA came to exist on the early Earth. And this is what Shostak's lab focuses almost entirely on, how RNA came into existence. And especially the hardest problem, the thing we've really been struggling with for the last 10 years or so, is how you could replicate RNA without enzymes, you know, just using chemistry and physics. In modern cells, when, when cells make a new RNA molecule, they use building blocks, I don't want to get too technical, but they're nucleoside triphosphates. They're molecules that are quite stable. You have enzymes that string them together in the right way. And it's great, but at the origin of life, there were no enzymes. You could only rely on chemistry in the right environment. One of the breakthroughs was to figure out a new, what we call activation chemistry, a way of making the, these building blocks more reactive. Well, so the, the way the story develops is actually quite interesting. So Lee, a postdoc in the lab, figured out a little bit of the chemistry that could make this work much better. And then a couple of other people in the lab figured out that actually this is a way of doing it that totally makes sense for mm. early Earth prebiotic chemistry. Without enzymes. Yeah, yeah. It makes, makes the whole thing work much better without enzymes. So, so is there a point where you say for this series of experiments we've – discovered what we wanted to get to and what and what is the finale here so what we're aiming for is being able to start with say one molecule of rna or some collection of rnas and then set up the right chemical environment and have it spontaneously replicate and make more of itself so we're not we're not there yet we have ideas about how to do it and i, I think we might we might solve that within the next couple of years if things work wow. out we need to put it all together. So we're going to have replicating RNA inside replicating compartments. Once we have that, that kind of system should start to evolve spontaneously. And that would be a pathway to life. There are other scientists who are looking for alternatives to RNA as the start to life. And that's because, as Shostek puts it, RNA is a big, complicated molecule. So some people think that maybe life started with something simpler. Ultimately, we may end up with several paths to life, and we may never know which is the one that actually happened on the early Earth, but that would be great too, because right now we don't have any paths, right? We'd just like to have at least one and maybe more. Coming up, was life on Earth inevitable? If you're getting a lot out of the important research that's shared on Big Brains, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show that you should check out. It's called Capital Isn't. Capital Isn't uses the latest economic thinking to zero in on the ways that capitalism is, and more often isn't, working today. From the debate over how to distribute a vaccine to the morality of a wealth tax, Capitalism clearly explains how capitalism can go wrong and what we can do about it. Listen to Capitalism, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network.
Everyone likes to feel special. We like to think of life on Earth as a one in a billion, trillion, quintillion chance. And everything had to go just so for us to get here, right? That is one of the big questions. So I think when I started to get into this seriously, it, there, there were so many gaps in our knowledge. It did seem like maybe it was going to be, it was a very, very hard process, something very unlikely for all the pieces to come together. The more I've worked in this area, more and more of those gaps are getting filled in in a way that makes it look like maybe all the steps are not that hard. Life requires the right environments, the right chemistry, but... It's possible that given a planetary environment, it might be almost inevitable. Wow. I wouldn't say that confidently yet, but it's, it, it could be. So what does that mean? Well, then the implication is that there should be life everywhere in the universe, right? If life is inevitable, given the right conditions, maybe we are not alone. Yeah, I mean, our field is very closely tied in with all these advances in astronomy, the whole amazing story of exoplanets and the fact that we now know that, you know, Earth is not unique. There are hundreds of millions of, of rocky planets in our galaxy. So one way of looking at this question of, you know, whether it's easy or hard for life to get started is it's basically the, the same question as, is life, you know, common? It's present on lots of these exoplanets or is it only here on our planet? And so we're all asking the same question and, and the astronomers are trying to get a clue by, you know, looking at the chemistry of the atmospheres of, mm -hmm. of some of these distant planets and we're trying to get clues by doing experiments in the lab. And if the astronomers get evidence for life on another planet, that would say, okay, it's not, you know, this incredibly improbable event that maybe only happened once in the whole history of the universe, right? It can't be that hard and so that would mean for us yeah, there's, there's an answer. We just have to go and find it. And on the other hand, if we're able to build living cells in the lab in a sort of series of relatively simple steps, then I think that would inspire the exoplanet community to look even harder for examples of life elsewhere. So I had to ask, of course, does Shostak believe in alien life? <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I used to say that I can't answer that because, you know, that's we're, we're trying to get the answer to that, uh -huh. to that question by trying to understand, you know, is it, is it easy or hard to get from chemistry to life? But I will say, over the last 10 years, I, I'm edging closer to the idea that it might not be that hard to go from chemistry to life. And so okay. there, it, I'd say there's a higher probability now than what I used to think that life is common on other planets. And so whereas your thinking may have been, it was really quite a, a distinct and unique process, as you keep saying, which has started hard to fathom, it's not that hard to create life under the right circumstances. Seeing that help and elsewhere starts giving a different level of confidence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're just filling in a lot of uh, the gaps in our knowledge. And every, every time we there's something that just seemed like, you know, how on earth could this possibly happen? You know, and then, mm -hmm. we, then we figure it out and it's, oh yeah, it's actually quite trivial. <laughs> and that starts to happen enough times, then you think, well, maybe the whole pathway is easy. <laughs> well, you know, I, I go back to the point where we started our conversation about the three fundamental questions of science. And I wonder if you can tell me, as you, as you have these thoughts, do you find it hard to shut off your brain? Um, and... <laughs> <laughs> to not be obsessing about this on a moment-by-moment -moment basis? Or is this something you're always turning over inside your head? I do think about it a lot. Yeah, I, I bet. And, but I love it, you know? It's fun. It's exciting. You know, uh -huh. one of my favorite things is just to take a blank pad of paper and start, you know, scribbling down ideas. And, you know, uh, sometimes something interesting comes up and then we can go in the lab and try things out. The thing about Shostak is that he believes the question of how life began is one that he and his team will be able to answer, and soon. And as excited as he is about finding that answer, he remains the utmost pragmatic scientist. I asked him what he thinks it will be like when he figures it all out. I don't think that there's likely to be a, a kind of aha moment where, you know, wow, now we see it, it'll 
be a kind of gradual shift where, you know, we, we can do little bits of copy and chemistry now and we need to make it a little bit better, a little bit better. At some point we'll start to see replication, but maybe it'll be too error prone and then we'll get it to work a little more accurately and there's still a lot more to do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, step by step. If you're getting a lot out of the important research shared on Big Brains, there's another University of Chicago Podcast Network show you should check out. It's called Not Another Politics Podcast. Not Another Politics Podcast provides a fresh perspective on the biggest political stories, not through opinions and anecdotes, but through rigorous scholarship, massive data sets, and a deep knowledge of theory. If you want to understand the political science behind the political headlines, then listen to Not Another Politics Podcast, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Big Brains is a production of the UChicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please give us a review and a rating. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap, with assistance from Alyssa Eads. Thanks for listening.